Clinton campaign kickoff. Democrat Hillary Clinton is set to launch her presidential campaign this Sunday. Fighting for life. A North Dakota teen meets resistance while starting a pro-life club in her public high school. Genocide remembered. Pope Francis to mark the 100th anniversary of the Armenian genocide with mass at St. Peter's Basilica. And divine mercy. A relatively recent Catholic devotion is celebrated across the world this Sunday. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Easter Friday, April 10th, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Searchers continue their work in northern Illinois to be sure that no one remains trapped in rubble from last night's deadly tornado. Meanwhile, part of that same storm system is moving toward the east coast tonight. Wyatt Gould be joining us with that story now. Brian, at this point, it's not likely the East Coast will get tornadoes like people in the Midwest saw yesterday, but it's all part of the same system that has left some communities devastated. More than a dozen tornadoes hit multiple states in the Midwest Thursday, but some of the worst damage happened in Fairdale and Rochelle, Illinois. Storm chasers caught it all on video. He's over! He's over! I feel like it's a bad dream, something I'd be watching on the news somewhere else, not in my neighborhood. Today, rescuers are searching the debris for survivors. Many are worried about residents who are trapped. The back wall of the building blew down and fell right on top of the two doors that had to be lifted up to get out, and we couldn't get out. Authorities say two people died in the storm, and more than a dozen were taken to the hospital with injuries. One Illinois sheriff lost his house in the tornado, but he says he's thankful. Everybody's going to build a new house and, and work hard and, and we'll get back to normal. So that's all that's important. Things can be replaced and the family's all safe. Everybody in the neighborhood's safe and, and uh, all, the, all our neighbors are safe. Daylight has helped officials who are still surveying the damage. So far, at least 17 buildings are destroyed with hundreds more damaged. It's uh, obviously distressing and our hearts go out to the families who are still here and who've left and uh, any, any of the, those who are injured. We've also learned the Diocese of Rockford is working with Catholic charities to assess the impact of the storm. Rockford's Bishop David Malloy plans to visit the area today. In addition, the American Red Cross and FEMA are on the ground. Brian? Thank you. Wyatt Goolsby. Now, some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Is a North Dakota public school district discriminating against pro-life clubs? Catherine Zeltner is following this developing story for us. Catherine? Brian, high school girls at two separate public schools in the Fargo School District have been trying for months to start a pro-life club. Both requests were originally denied. When asked to reconsider, the district agreed to classify the pro-life clubs as outside agencies. This means limited meeting times, no posters, no school announcements, and the club can't host events on school grounds. Meanwhile, clubs including Gay Straight Alliances have been given official status in the district. A national law firm has issued a demand letter on behalf of the students. It charges the school district has unconstitutionally discriminated against pro-life students. The Thomas More Society says the school district is censoring free speech. Here, because the club is pro-life, the school district has decided to treat them as second-class citizens and restrict their ability to get their message out. And that is not just unfair, it's actually illegal. After attending the March for Life, Bridget O'Keefe wanted to start a pro-life group at her Fargo High School. She started a book club before, but says this experience was much more difficult. I spoke with Bridget yesterday and a Students for Life of America coordinator. Angela, is this an isolated case? Is it always a little bit more difficult to get a pro-life group started at a high school? Honestly, yes. Um, we do tend to face more challenges with our public high schools, but that's part of why Students for Life of America is working with these students. We want to ensure that their rights are being respected and protected. So. And Bridget, the district calls your pro-life club an outside agency. What has that meant and how is that different than being an official school club? What it basically means is we get a room in the school for an hour. We don't get to use the school name in our group name, such as we wanted to use Spartans for Life for our name, but we couldn't in this situation as an outside organization. 
and we can't put up flyers or leave anything in the room or anywhere else in the school and we're kind of discouraged from really any outside any interaction with the rest of the school mm. and finally Bridget if you can just share why do you want to bring a pro-life club to your high school I think it's important that my peers see both all sides of what's going on in our society right now and understand really all life issues. The Fargo School District hasn't responded to our repeated requests for comment. A release sent to local media says the district takes the demand letter seriously and it is being reviewed. Brian. All right, thank you, Katherine Zeltner. Well, it's all but official and not all that surprising. Democrat Hillary Clinton will run for the White House. People familiar with her plans say the former First Lady, U.S. Senator, and Secretary of State will launch her campaign this Sunday. The sources say she'll make the announcement in a video posted to social media, then make stops in key early primary states. In 2008, Clinton lost the primary race to President Obama, who then named her Secretary of State. She's recently faced criticism for using private email while serving as America's chief diplomat. Clinton, the first Democrat to declare, is not expected to face serious competition from within her own party. President Obama and Cuban President Raul Castro will likely cross paths today at a summit of the Americas in Panama. It would be their first face-to-face -face meeting since an announcement of plans to restore ties between Cuba and the U.S. Cuban officials say the two leaders spoke on the phone last night. It's only the second known conversation between U.S. and Cuban leaders in more than 50 years. A formal meeting is not expected during this summit. God's Divine Mercy is celebrated throughout the world this Sunday in a special way at a particular church near the Vatican. We're joined by our Rome correspondent, Alan Holdren. Alan, tell us about the church where you are and its connection with the Divine Mercy celebration this weekend. Well, the church that you see over my left shoulder here is called the, the Church of Santo Spirito in Sassia. And during John Paul II's pontificate, he established it as the Divine Mercy Shrine here in Rome. He had a special devotion to Divine Mercy, which uh, he believed uh, was the, the incredible, all-encompassing forgiveness and mercy of God. Uh, and he wanted everybody to know that. He actually called his pontificate one of uh, dedication to the mercy of God. And we're seeing that mercy theme in the pontificate of Pope Francis. Give us, if you would, a brief origin, a brief history of this Divine Mercy devotion. Mm -hmm. Well, it came from a fellow Pole, one of John Paul II's compatriots. This was uh, from Sister Faustina Kowalska. She lived uh, in, in Poland at the turn of the century, the last century. She died in the 1930s. She left behind a diary that her spiritual director asked her to write on these revelations about God's mercy and its limitless quality. She wanted to make sure that everybody knew that that was available also to them. There are many Divine Mercy celebrations throughout the world this weekend. Talk about why the Divine Mercy celebration is even more significant than ever this year in light of Pope Francis' plans for a year, a jubilee year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. On uh, just tomorrow, actually, Pope Francis is going to convoke that year of mercy that won't start until December, but he's going to release what they call a papal bull. And in this document, He's going to be uh, giving parameters. He's going to be giving an idea to the faithful of what he expects from this year of mercy and how they can go about celebrating it. Uh, years of mercy, well, jubilee years in the church, are meant to uh, be times of forgiveness, times of celebration of this mercy of God. And uh, Pope Francis, in his pontificate, has spoken repeatedly of mercy. This is a, a very close connection he has also with John Paul II, who called the day that he established Divine Mercy Sunday uh, the greatest day of his life. So, Alan, have mm -hmm. you seen any indication as to what we might expect in the papal bull that will be issued tomorrow? Uh, we're, we're not actually sure, Brian. Uh, I have spoken with uh, the Archbishop who was advising Pope Francis on this papal bull. He's in charge of the Pontifical Council for a New Evangelization. Uh, he will actually be with us this next Monday following the celebration to tell us more about what is enclosed in this papal bull. Uh, it, some of it will be read on Saturday, uh, tomorrow during this, this Vespers celebration, a prayer service in St. Peter's Basilica. We will know more then. All right, Alan Holdren, our eyes and ears in the Eternal City. Thanks for joining us from Rome tonight, Alan. Thank you so much, Brian. 
An EWTN features Sunday Mass from the birthplace of the Divine Mercy devotion. Then later, from the Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Massachusetts, there's a special Holy Hour Sunday afternoon at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansfield, Alabama. Find a complete Divine Mercy Sunday programming schedule at EWTN.com. We just found this out today. Pope Francis will make a second trip to his native South America this summer. The Holy Father travels to Ecuador, Bolivia, and Paraguay July 6th through the 12th. He celebrated Mass for millions of young people at the 2013 World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Coming up, an Indiana pizzeria in the middle of a firestorm over redefining marriage reopens. And we recall the atrocity that began 100 years ago, wiping out more than a million Armenians. On this 10th day of April, Friday in the octave of Easter, thanks for joining us, I'm Brian Patrick. Pope Francis celebrates a special mass on Sunday, marking next week's 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Armenian genocide. Historians estimate Ottoman Turks systematically killed up to one and a half million Armenians during and after World War I. Jason Calvi has more. In the course of researching... Historian Ruben Adalian archives photos of the Armenian genocide. Starting in 1915, the Ottoman Empire expelled about two million Armenian Christians from their homeland. Many died of starvation. So human beings were thrown to what would have transported animals. Their goal? Purifying their state uh, by creating a country without Christians in it, and, and hence the expulsion and the destruction of the Christian communities. But the United States stepped in. The American diplomats in particular, seeing what was happening, cabled back to the State Department and said there's a campaign of race extermination underway. We need to do something. Lest they perish, American Congress, the American people coming to the aid of those people in need, the 400,000 orphans starving. The American people raised about $116 million at that time. Pope Benedict the 15th also spoke out. He is on record uh, having written to the Sultan of Turkey and uh, taken multiple steps uh, protesting the, the Armenian genocide. In this respect, he is a, a, a world leader uh, uncompared to any other of that era. Dr. Adalian studied the Vatican archives on the genocide and found a list of survivors. I saw uh, my last name on that list. And he's here today because all four of his grandparents escaped. In Washington, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Jason. An Indiana pizzeria that closed after the owner said his religious beliefs won't allow him to cater gay weddings has now reopened. Memories Pizza faced violent threats and hateful social media messages after the comments. The owner says gays are welcome in his restaurant, but he won't cater same-sex weddings. He says that conflicts with his Christian beliefs. Supporters used online crowdfunding to raise more than $840,000 for that pizzeria. Well, that was just one example of the backlash to Indiana's recent passage of a controversial law. We talked about it earlier this week with an outspoken proponent of religious freedom. Joining us by satellite from Princeton University, Dr. Robert George, a McCormick professor of jurisprudence there at Princeton. And there was so much backlash to these laws that have been passed in Indiana and Arkansas for religious freedom that there was revisions, there were revisions made. Do you think that those revisions will water down these laws? Yes, very considerably. In fact, they will undermine religious freedom. Those revisions should never have been made. As a matter of fact, we'd be better off with no Religious Freedom Restoration Acts rather than with uh, laws that have been changed in the way that uh, these acts have been changed under pressure from organized groups uh, favoring same-sex marriage and abortion and so forth. So uh, it's very regrettable that the politicians, uh, Republican politicians, I might add, conservative politicians caved in under pressure from the left to revise those laws and to gut them of their religious liberty protections. Why do you think the climate is so hostile toward religious beliefs at this point? Well, I think because uh, secularism has gained control of the elite institutions of the culture. And uh, as a result of that, they've been able to put tremendous pressure on the economic and political institutions of the society. And so uh, those forces can pressure businesses into declaring, for example, that if religious liberty is protected in Indiana, they will withdraw from doing business in Indiana. And the same businesses, by the way, who do business in places where terrible crimes against human rights are committed, such as uh, China. 
uh, such as, such as uh, Saudi Arabia, and yet hypocritically, under pressure uh, from the cultural left, they say they won't do business in Indiana simply because it protects people's uh, religious liberty. We saw something very similar, of course, in Arkansas. And then pressures brought to bear on uh, politicians. Uh, Governor Pence in uh, Indiana, Mike Pence, who was thought to be a strong defender of marriage and religious liberty, caved. He caved. He folded under pressure uh, from the left. Uh, same with uh, uh, the governor of, uh, of Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson. Uh, to add insult to injury there, he claimed that uh, the reason he was giving up the uh, ordinary RIPRA protection and demanding these revisions, which would uh, gut, the, uh, gut the law essentially, was because his son uh, had signed a petition calling upon him uh, to do so. Well, I'm afraid that the citizens of Arkansas didn't elect Seth Hutchinson as governor. They elected Asa Hutchinson as governor, and it was his obligation to protect religious liberty, not to fold because his son told him to do it. Very briefly, there have been, there's been a lot of comparison to these state laws to the federal RIFRA that was passed in the 90s, signed by President Clinton. Are, are they different or are they similar? In substance, they are the same. Uh, the uh, additions to the laws uh, in Indiana and Arkansas simply have to do with spelling out what the courts have found to be uh, implicit uh, in laws that are exactly uh, patterned on the uh, federal law, indeed the federal law itself, for example, in the, uh, in the Hobby Lobby case. So there is no difference in substance, and the claim that there is is simply one more uh, disingenuous, misleading bit of spin that's meant to justify undermining religious liberty in the United States in order to protect the, uh, the goals uh, that, uh, in this case, the people who want same-sex marriage and who do not want people to be able to dissent from it in the practice of their uh, business affairs are after. All right, Dr. Robert George joining us by satellite from Princeton University. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. That conversation recorded earlier this week, and her story inspires us to live life to the fullest. College basketball player Lauren Hill passed away this morning from an inoperable brain tumor. The freshman at Cincinnati's College of Mount St. Joseph helped raise well over a million dollars for cancer research. She called it a dream come true when the NCAA moved up that team's opening game so the 19-year-old could play, scoring the final points. As her cancer progressed, Lauren reminded others to appreciate life. May God rest her soul. Up next, the president's disparaging remark about Christians at this week's Easter prayer breakfast draws criticism. And we explore the legacy of St. John Paul II, 10 years after his burial. Thank God for Friday, and it's Easter Friday at that. Can I add a hallelujah? President Obama's comment, a glib comment, about Christians this week at the Easter prayer breakfast didn't sit well with a lot of people. Addressing a group of religious leaders invited to the White House, the president went off script to take a jab at his critics. On Easter, I do reflect on the fact that as a Christian, I am supposed to love. And I have to say that sometimes when I listen to uh, less than loving expressions by Christians, I get concerned. But that's a topic for another day. The Catholic League's Bill Donahue says the president is careful not to offend Muslims, but he doesn't seem to mind offending Christians. Others said they were appalled that he would use an Easter prayer breakfast with fellow Christians to disparage them. Kathy Roos, a senior fellow at the Family Research Council, joins us to look a little deeper into this. Did you find those remarks offensive? Well, sure, and coming just a few months um, after the other remarks where he told Christians to get off our high horse when we were concerned and still are concerned about Christian persecution worldwide, um, it's, it's frankly sad and kind of strange that at these prayer breakfast events, he seems to not be able to stop himself from scolding Christians. Uh, frankly, it's, it's perplexing. Yeah, I noticed at the National Prayer Breakfast, he, he used it more for a, opportunities for humor. Uh, and he it, it doesn't seem to understand what a prayer breakfast is. I wonder, wouldn't this have been a good opportunity for him to show solidarity, especially with persecuted Christians right now? Well, there, there's no more important time for him to do that than now. And just days after um, Islamic extremists barged into a school, singled out the Christian children, and slaughtered them. You know, this was days after that. And the president decides it's a good idea to go off 
uh, teleprompter and scold Christians for unloving expressions. It, it, it's, it's really, it's baffling, but it, more than anything, it's sad. And we deserve better from our president. Does it send a signal to those who would threaten Christians that America may not stand up for them? Well, I, you have to wonder what kind of signal it's sending. Like I said, you know, we are in seeing a, an atrocious persecution of Christians worldwide. And what we need now is strength and solidarity, as you say, from our president. And we, we get this kind of snarky snarkiness at, um, on our high holy day. This is the holiest day for us. And, you know, you don't see President Obama, you know, scolding Muslims on Muslim um, holy days. It's, it's just the Christians he's after, it seems. So it, uh, it makes no sense unless he's talking about his pastor, Jeremiah Wright. And there have been some unloving things that that man has said. But odds are he's not talking about Jeremiah Wright. He's talking about us. And probably because we uh, uh, will not stop um, believing and supporting and loving Christ and his church on earth and what that church teaches about marriage. I think it all really comes down to that question. It's been an interesting week here in Washington. Mm -hmm. Kathy Roos, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Evening. My pleasure. Well, this week marked 10 years since the massive Christian burial for Pope John Paul II. Tonight, we revisit his national shrine here in Washington, where we find first-class relics of this modern-day saint. Patrick Kelly, the executive director of the St. John Paul II National Shrine, joining us from the shrine here in D.C. Patrick, it's been 10 years since the funeral of John Paul II, a little less than a year since he was canonized. What kind of response have you seen there at the shrine since he was declared a saint? We've had thousands and thousands of people go through our exhibit. And uh, at the end of our exhibit, they, they, they're given the opportunity to write a note to John Paul II. And some of those notes that they write are just absolutely touching about how he has touched their lives. And they can actually touch him in a personal way there at the shrine. You have two first-class relics of St. John Paul II. What does that do for those who really want to get closer to this saint? The first is a piece of the cassock that is stained with John Paul II's blood, and he was wearing that cassock on the day of the assassination attempt in St. Peter's Square. Uh, in 1981. And then, and then the, uh, the second relic we have is a vial of his blood, of his actual blood. So that is, and, and we have those relics are out every day, and people really uh, are able to venerate those relics and feel a sense of connection to John Paul II to really, uh, and I think it really is an aid for intercessory prayer. I mean, people bring their petitions here to the shrine. They bring they bring all of the, the, the prayers that they have, and they ask for his intercession. And those relics really help with that prayer. There are so many saints in the communion of saints. Some are officially canonized, many are not. But this is a saint that we do. We watched him go through his life and suffering toward the end of his life. What do you think the legacy of St. John Paul II is, especially for Catholics who are alive today? I think the most important legacy is the legacy of love that he imparted upon all that he touched. And th that legacy really is, is what we are all experiencing today and what we're living. I mean, I, I really think the most profound legacy of John Paul II is in the lives of, of those men and women that he touched, those men and women who went on to marry and have children. And those children, I think, are the legacy of John Paul II. And I think the same is true for, for uh, priests and religious sisters. I mean, I think so many of them, uh, they owe their vocation to John Paul II. So I think their service to the church is, is really the living legacy of John Paul II. Beautifully put, and the National Shrine is a national treasure for us. Patrick Kelly, the uh, Executive Director of St. John Paul II National Shrine. Thanks for being with us on this special day, Patrick. Thank you, Brian. And a great destination if you get to D.C. Until Monday, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You can watch again on EWTN's YouTube page. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Happy Easter. Have a good Divine Mercy Sunday. Good night.